بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي ونسلم على رسوله الكريم ما بعد uh, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته to all the participants of this uh, prestigious uh, second virtual international halal conference uh, uh, I'm indeed honored and privileged to be invited to this uh, particular program and I'd like to share with you South Africa and halal certification, some of our history and a little bit of our achievements and successes, and uh, hope uh, that uh, by the sharing we could all benefit, inshallah. Uh, uh, South Africa and halal certification uh, is, is, is a, a, a subject which is very unique from many experiences that the rest of the world uh, would have encountered. Uh, I have been part of uh, the South African National Halal Authority from its inception uh, way back in 1996 when it was founded. Uh, prior to that, I was with the uh, Jamiatul Ulama, uh, who was the Council of Theologians of the uh, Greater uh, Gauteng uh, and surrounding provinces at that time known as the Transvaal province. And uh, uh, Halal certification was rather a fragmented approach at the time where regions had their own halal certification bodies uh, and were looking at the the uh, social welfare, religious needs of their communities in that particular area. And then uh, when uh, we faced the new dispensation came in in the early 90s and we faced various challenges in the field of halal uh, and it was felt that we should establish a central halal certification body uh, nationally represented and all role players from all over the country got together and alhamdulillah we were quite successful in 1996 when uh, almost every organization was part of the national initiative and i was then seconded by the council of theologians the jamia ulama to represent them on the national uh, forum so uh, that is the brief background uh, but coming to uh, Africa itself, <clears throat> Africa has a, a, a very strong relationship with Islam. And uh, those that know a bit of Islamic history will know that uh, the earliest uh, uh, contact that Muslims of Arabia had with any other country or continent was Africa. It was in the year 631 Hijri that uh, when the Muslims were uh, being persecuted in Makkah to Mukarramah, the early Muslims that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam you know, advised and instructed them to move on to Habasha, which is uh, uh, the Ethiopia, Eritrea area, Abyssinia, uh, uh, where there was a Christian king, Najashi, who was very uh, compassionate, affectionate and kind. And uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, accordingly uh, instructed them to migrate to uh, uh, to Habasha. Uh, and this is the amazing uh, uh, association and relationship that Africa enjoys with Islam. So uh, yes, uh, they they approached uh, the King Negus or Najashi at the time and he gave them refuge. Uh, and uh, they were able to live comfortably for that period of time until they were then advised to return and then the second migration took place to Medina. So Africa in itself is, is, is an amazing uh, uh, co uh, continent and it has um, in excess of 500 million Muslims. So uh, many people would, would not know even that uh, the, the, the greater part of West and North Africa uh, is Muslim. Uh, Southern African region and South Africa where we are, uh, the Muslim population is rather uh, uh, lesser. In fact, in South Africa, we only have uh, a maximum 2 million Muslims uh, that uh, reside in South Africa. Okay, Islam in South Africa is also not new. It's unlike Europe where it's, you know, five, six, seven decades old. Islam in South Africa is almost four centuries old. Uh, the the uh, early uh, Muslims landed in Cape Town, which is on the southern tip of uh, um, Africa, of the on the southern tip of the African continent. And that is the beautiful mother city of Cape Town that you see in front of 
few, and that's where the first Muslims were brought in. Uh, there were three waves of immigrants uh, and influx of Muslims into South Africa. The first was with the Malay community, uh, or, or, or who were brought in as political prisoners uh, from the uh, uh, Indonesia Java area at the time, and uh, uh, they were they were brought in and they actually laid the foundations of Islam. And it's amazing the historical artifacts as well. If you ever visit uh, Cape Town, that you will able to see handwritten Qurans by the by the Mashaikh of the time, and the great work that they did in uh, laying the foundations of Islam in this part of the world. The second uh, uh, wave of Muslims came through in the late 1800s when uh, the British were ruling. So the, the, the Dutch brought the, the, the uh, Malay Muslims through and then the British colonialists brought the Indian Muslims through. Uh, they were brought in, uh, uh, the, the, the British colonialists decided to needed indentured labor to work the sugarcane fields uh, in uh, South Africa. So they brought Indian laborers as indentured labor uh, through. And, and at the time, many of our forefathers who were um, uh, businessmen and entrepreneurs uh, also uh, took the opportunity to look for greener pastures and came down to South Africa in the late 1800s and early 1900s. The third wave was uh, obviously in the, in the uh, uh, 1990s, uh, you know, when... Uh, the uh, sanctions were lifted and the new dispensation came in. Uh, people uh, from North Africa, a huge wave of Muslims from Egypt and uh, Somalia and uh, Kenya uh, all also came down and settled in South Africa. So uh, these were the three influxes that we have of the Muslim community in this country. Muslim infrastructure is amazing and is actually a mind-boggling and unique uh, because you will not find this type of in infrastructure in many countries of the world, whether you go to uh, the Oceanic region or whether you go to the Americas uh, or many countries in Europe as well. Uh, amazing, great infrastructure. Uh, our four forebears and our forefathers did, uh, did great work. Uh, they uh, laid very strong foundations of, of Islam. Uh, there's in excess of a thousand masajid in the country and not just little homes that were converted, but proper structures and no governmental aid or assistance whatsoever. These were Muslims, uh, Muslim communities that uh, got together and built these masajid all over the country. Uh, Madaris and Makatib, these, this was also a very important uh, cornerstone laid by our forebears where uh, they ensured that the uh, Islamic education of the children is uh, upheld, maintained all the time. So there's uh, uh, in excess of uh, a thousand madaris as well all over the country uh, which teach basic Islamic education to children. Uh, Muslim schools, uh, this also started uh, in the in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, where dedicated schools to preserve, you know, once we moved out into the new uh, dispensation in the early 90s, we were exposed to a whole host of different challenges that, that children were faced. And to preserve Muslim identity um, uh, and Islamic ethos, uh, the, the uh, leadership of the country uh, established Muslim schools in the various uh, cities. So there are tens of Muslim schools dedicated to uh, both uh, uh, that cater for both secular and Islamic education. Higher institutions of learning, uh, Darul Ulooms and Islamic universities, uh, there's in excess of 20 of uh, such institutions in the country. Uh, up until uh, the uh, uh, 80s, uh, whoever wanted to pursue higher Islamic education would travel to either uh, Mecca, Medina, Egypt, India, Pakistan, uh, to go and seek uh, higher Islamic education, but amazingly now, in 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 uh, you know over the last 15, 20 years, there are students with the with the uh, high level of Islamic education and uh, higher Islamic education made made available. We have students from all over the world, from the Americas, from Europe, uh, from Russia, from Asia, Southeast Asia, Oceanic region, and even uh, the Middle East, uh, where. 
these uh, students are now coming to South Africa to study. Uh, there's an amazing uh, 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 social welfare infrastructure as well, and not only to cater for uh, the uh, uh, poverty-stricken and the needy within the country, uh, these welfare organizations respond to international needs, whether they be in, in, in the Far East uh, uh, or, or West of the, of the globe. All of my leadership, we have, uh, alhamdulillah, due to the uh, foundations laid and due to the institutions we have as well, uh, there's a very strong ulama leadership in the country. Uh, each province has their, uh, uh, has their ulama leadership that uh, guide them. And then uh, uh, in addition to the, to, to the social religious needs of the country, they also unite under the United Ulama Council of South Africa, which is a national uh, platform uh, uh, where they need to deal with national issues, whether they be um, uh, socially with the community or with government itself. And yes, halal certification uh, also has a long history in South Africa. It's probably amongst the oldest uh, initiatives uh, globally uh, because uh, you know the 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 leadership. I had way back in the in the late 60s and early 70s established halal certification services uh, in the various uh, uh, provinces and regions. Uh, all NGOs, all non-governmental organizations, and the amazing unique thing about uh, halal certification in South Africa, unlike other parts of the world where halal certification was... Uh, uh, is primarily done for export of products to other countries. And they don't have a strong halal regulated infrastructure to guide the local Muslim community. So there's so there's much, uh, I would say, liberalism, if you want to call it. You know, everybody make, uses his own discretion and determines what is halal or not. In South Africa, it's very different, where the halal certification over the years uh, over the last 50, 60 years that we have the services rendered, it was primarily done uh, for the local community. So people needed to eat meat and eat chicken and eat uh, food products. Accordingly, the leadership uh, uh, approached these industries and regulated them, guided them, directed them. Uh, and we've the the greatest achievement that we've got in South Africa, really, and it's a it's a major plus factor, and that is that we have uh, a very strong Muslim consumer. So uh, Muslim consumers require halal; uh, they would demand halal. They would approach the 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 uh, uh, the uh, uh, the stores or the manufacturers and and request halal products and there's an informed consumer base so you know uh, that's 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 been one major plus factor that we've got in this country alhamdulillah some interesting facts about south africa and this is uh, really interesting as to why you know uh, why this is all happening uh, uh, Look at the look at this fact, uh, uh, which was uh, published in 2017. South Africa ranked amongst the top 10 Muslim-friendly non-OIC destinations for tourism. Okay, uh, then the halal economy, in terms of halal producers in South Africa, uh, we ranked amongst the top five global producers of halal products. You know, so th these are amazing factors. Just keeping in mind that we've just got a small Muslim population out of out of a population of of, uh, of uh, 55, 60 million, we're only two million. So we we're about one and a half, two percent of the of the uh, uh, population in this country. Yet there is this achievement. Uh, Poultry abattoirs in the country, there's approximately production in commercial poultry abattoirs of about uh, six, uh, six to seven million birds a week. And all these major commercial poultry establishments are all certified halal. Uh, similarly, red meat abattoirs, all the larger red meat abattoirs in the country also comply uh, and uh, uh, have strict halal regulation. And unlike other countries where, you know, you have uh, morning halal and afternoon non-halal or one day halal, one day non-halal, all abattoirs in South Africa that do halal slaughter are exclusively halal. Uh, you know, you, you, you can't be uh, half pregnant, as they say, where you have one day halal or a few hours halal and the rest non-halal. 
the FMCG industry, look at this. If you if you walk in any supermarket aisle in South Africa, uh, you will find almost 45 to 50% of all products, FMCG products on supermarket shelves uh, carrying some halal certification or the other. Uh, restaurant chains, uh, many of them comply. Uh, in fact, most of them comply and are associated with some halal certification body or the other. Uh, so, uh, the, the, and globally, the trend is eating out. Uh, so, uh, you know, you have to cater for these needs of the Muslim community as you go on. And we have a, a strong association with many franchise outlets in, uh, in the country as well. So uh, I don't want to be seen to be just blowing my trumpet about South Africa, but there are uh, certain reasons and, and, and the uh, rationale behind the uh, South Africa success story. What are they? Uh, the most important thing, as I said, is education and awareness. So we've got an absolutely strong uh, Muslim consumer, a very educated Muslim consumer, a very informed Muslim consumer. And that is one of the great success stories where uh, you will find manufacturers and retailers ensuring that they comply so, th so that they could uh, 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 get uh, their custom and patronage from, from the Muslim community, who obviously are known to have a a huge uh, disposable income when it comes to food, especially. Uh, then we also have uh, a very strong Muslim business community. And uh, that is also one of the big reasons uh, why we have uh, 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 such a strong support for halal in this country. Uh, in, in, in just the FMCG sector, uh, there's a, a approximately 35 to 40% of Muslims that uh, that own uh, supermarkets and uh, uh, you know uh, cash and carries and wholesale wholesales, so uh, they also dictate to the industry uh, that look we require to sell halal product, and since we are required to sell halal product, we cannot purchase your product if your product's not halal, which has also uh, laid great support. Uh, to the uh, uh, halal uh, industry in this country. And uh, yes, the government have been very supportive uh, of uh, halal uh, and the halal industry in general, especially of recent. We've had uh, various provincial governments also uh, launching uh, uh, halal initiatives. Uh, this, this happened last year where the KwaZulu-Natal uh, 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 provincial government uh, launched a halal initiative uh, and and which has taken off very well, and then uh, the Western Cape actually uh, was was one step ahead. They have been for the last few years uh, very involved and very supportive and looking at ways and means of growing the halal industry. Now I'll just uh, touch on a few interesting things uh, which many people would uh, would not know. Uh, Halal hasn't really uh, been something that has been uh, 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 mooted and motivated and initiated by Muslim countries. Unfortunately, not. Uh, whilst uh, you know uh, the rest of the world have been leaps and bounds, the non-Muslim world have been leaps and bounds in trying to uh, establish a, a strong halal industry within their countries. Uh, Muslim countries lag behind, and it was only about uh, seven, eight years ago. You know that the OIC actually uh, acknowledged the this uh, shortcoming uh, and decided that look we need to we need to do uh, something about this and Muslim countries started establishing some halal standards of some sort. Uh, you wouldn't uh, probably know which was the first port to have halal logistics in the world. It wasn't Saudi Arabia, neither was it uh, Oman or uh, any of the Middle Eastern countries. Nor was it any uh, was it Malaysia or, or Indonesia for that matter. The first halal port was established in in the Netherlands in Rotterdam. Okay, so they 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 uh, understood the this need uh, of halal logistics, and uh, they they've been the leaders in in uh, this particular initiative. Which country established the first halal laboratory, the first halal science laboratory? to uh, uh, determine the halal status of ingredients and products and doubtful and uh, uh, unlawful items wasn't either any of the Muslim countries or any of the Islamic countries. 
it was but uh, Thailand, uh, which is a Buddhist country. They, 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 they've, they've taken the lead in establishing the halal uh, science uh, uh, laboratory in the world. The majority of the world's halal products, where are they manufactured? As I said earlier, it's not in Muslim countries. In fact, in a research that was done, 85% of halal certified products were being manufactured in non-Muslim countries. And hence you see, uh, you know, why South Africa ranked amongst the five top producers of halal products. So it wasn't only about South Africa as well, you know, uh, uh, and and this is uh, this is something that uh, uh, we can we can uh, all learn from the South African experience, uh, where halal certification wasn't being run as a private business. So uh, we ran it purely for community benefit. It was run as public benefit, non-profit organizations, and uh, uh, thus. If we were able to share this information and 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 uh, the expertise and experience with various countries all over the world, we did so, and uh, this has also been an amazing uh, achievement on on behalf of halal certification in South Africa, where we've contributed to various other countries, uh, uh, and I'm not going to mention the other provinces, but since we're focusing on South Africa and Africa. Uh, uh, we, we, we've got uh, a strong logistical support that we uh, assist and render various organizations in South Africa, and some of them we've, we've in fact assisted in establishing, uh, you know, from, from the foundation onward. So if you take uh, Botswana, uh, which is a neighboring country in Namibia, which is also a neighboring country on the west coast, uh, of uh, Southern Africa, Malawi, uh, uh, you know, we've been very instrumental uh, in their foundation as well. Uh, Zimbabwe, we've got strong association with them as well. All neighboring countries, Mozambique, we've assisted them also in their establishment. Uh, then Kenya as well, uh, 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 we've got association with them and, and strong uh, affiliation since their establishment uh, uh, some uh, decade or so ago. Tanzania uh, also uh, has recently uh, established the Tanzania Halal Certification Council, and we've been very, very strongly assisting and supporting them all along. Uh, and uh, most recently, it's been Seychelles, uh, you know, because of the uh, increasing uh, awareness amongst the global Muslim community and people wanting halal product when they go to these holiday destinations. Uh, uh, Seychelles has also come uh, on board and established the uh, halal authority in that uh, little island. And yes, we've got strong association with uh, the island of Mauritius as well. Uh, some of you might have had the opportunity to visit and uh, uh, yeah, so just to give you an overview, that's the that's the uh, uh, the the uh, assistance, support, uh, cooperation, and network that we we readily provide uh, to organizations all over the world. Obviously, if you run your organization like a business, you don't want to share because it's business secret. But uh, Alhamdulillah, here it has been very different in that this has been rendered as a uh, as a service to the Ummah. And accordingly, we'd like to see that uh, service developing in every corner of the world. Uh, in conclusion, uh, yes, unification forums are important at every level, whether it be locally. Uh, you know, they say you must uh, think globally, but act locally. So unification forums, both uh, locally and internationally, uh, has been an ongoing process. Uh, we've got to unite and collaborate to strengthen the halal uh, certification uh, services that are rendered. There has to be strong stakeholder engagement with the various role players, whether it be halal certification bodies, whether it be uh, technical experts, whether it be the community. Uh, uh, people must have confidence in what you do. Uh, so uh, public programs, radio programs, uh, social media presence, so that people appreciate exactly what is being done and are able to question uh, 
uh, how things are being done so that they have satisfaction and assurance in terms of the service that uh, that are rendered. So we've got to consolidate these relationships as well. And yes, uh, you know, we we're living in a in in a little village, and notwithstanding the limitations we've had over the last five six months in terms of travel. Uh, that will ease out. And uh, uh, there is a great move towards halal hospitality and, and, and around uh, Muslim-friendly tourism, which is uh, also another entire field uh, on its own, which uh, people and organizations like uh, uh, Crescent Rating are leading and, and doing very well, alhamdulillah. So think globally, uh, uh, globally act locally, and prioritize smart. Uh, you know, we've got to know exactly what we want to achieve, uh, how uh, uh, we're going to achieve it. Is it possible? Is it something that we can achieve? Is it something that we have control over? Is it relevant in terms of what we want to do right now? Is it relevant? And uh, how are we going to achieve it? What are the deadlines and timelines that we are going to set to achieve it? And remember that if you're going to walk this path if you want to achieve what you want to very fast, you're going to have to go alone. But if you want to go far, if you'd like to go the extra distance, then going alone is not going to be the answer. We're going to have to walk this path together. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.